All right, so welcome back everybody to today's class. And in today, we are continuing on our journey with life insurance class. Uh, we will con be continuing with chapter four. All right, um, I'm not going to, I hope the class is going great for you. Also, I hope you've been consistent. Hope you've been staying on track with whatever you plan to achieve within um, the scheduled time frame. All right, um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave it in the comment section. I'm going ahead to share my screen. My goal today is to see if I can finish chapter four and right immediately do the chapter four um, um, question and answer all in one class. But we'll see how that goes, okay? All right, in chapter four, we will be looking at universal life. <laughs> All right. Now, right off the bat, we are being meant to understand here that policies issued prior to January 1st, 2017, has been grandfathered and vested rights surrounding tax advantages will be maintained. Changes to these policies might affect vested rights and should be carefully considered. I think in the course of this chapter, we're going to see what this vested right is. You know that the um, policies that were issued prior to January 1st, 2017 were grandfathered into. Okay. Now we move on to transparency through unbundling. You see, universal life insurance combines life insurance with tax advantage investing. That is, policyholders do not pay premiums. They make deposits to the policy. Deposit goes into an investment account, and that account pays expenses and is the source of funds for the investing. Wow, you get that, right? You see, now, Universal life is considered highly flexible type of policy for its policyholders is the most. Universal life is the most flexible form of life insurance. Also universal life is more complicated due to the insurance investment nature. Now there are three factors that determine the premium for all forms of life insurance whether term insurance, whole life, or universal life. The one thing I want you guys to understand right off the bat right here now is that universal life is the most flexible form of life insurance. It's the life insurance that put the power of choice in the hands of the policyholder through the help of his or her advisor, all right? Now, regardless of whether term insurance, whole life, or universal life, there are three factors that determine the premium that the policyholder pays. Number one is the mortality cost. That is the cost of life in short, also called the mortality charges, okay? Number two is administrative expenses of the insurance company. Number three is the investment income, all right? Because if the investment income does well, then there'll be more money for the whole life we saw that if the investment income does well and they were able to put enough funds into the, um, what's it called, the kit, there's the name for it. You know, they require pool that they needed, then they are able to distribute the leftovers with those that have participating whole life. Now, administrative costs, we look at what those admin costs were in the previous chapters which is the cost of paying insurance uh, brokers like uh, myself, um, the cost of maybe running a medical test on the writing cost, and then different other costs that the um, insurance company have to undertake in the cost of insuring this person. Now, in a whole life policy, these three factors are bundled together. The policyholder does not know how much of the premium pay gets applied to what, oh, to which cost or which expenses. Wow. But in universal life policies, all these 
podcast I've reviewed. Hmm. Universal Life Policies review how each of these three cost factors is calculated and applied to an individual policy. Does your policy provides transparency since information is openly disclosed and unbundling since the factors are clearly separated from each other? This is interesting. Policyholders can better understand their policy and its cash value when they have this information available to them. The cash value in a universal life policy is the value of the investment account. Wonderful. Yeah, and that's why when we run illustration, we are able to show people the cost of insurance. Yeah, then their cash value. Interesting. Anyways, we move on to premium tax, okay? Contracts and sales literature refers to the amount that a policyholder pays into a universal policy as deposit and not premiums. So due to their roles as both an insurance and investment options, however, for consistency, we will use the term premium exactly, you know, because that's what we always use, all right, to refer to them. But in a no term of it is, they're not referred to as premium. They are referred to as deposit, all right, for universal life. Now, a provincial tax between 2% and 4% is charged on all premiums paid into a universal policy. This premium tax reduces the amount of deposit to the investment account, and the remainder of which goes into the policy's investment account. Now, the policyholder can avoid this premium tax by investing that same money outside of a universal policy. For example, by investing in mutual funds or GIC. Hmm. Mortality charges. By now, if you know what mortality charges is, right? Okay, as with, yeah, because we've seen that in term insurance, we've seen it on that whole life. As with term and whole life policies, the mortality costs for universal policies reflect the insurance company's cost of paying out the death benefits. The insurance company deducts the mortality cost from the investment account. Later in this chapter in section 4.3, you will learn that the policyholder has some choice around how the mortality costs and calculated administrative expenses. Okay, so we've seen the mortality cost, what it entails now is the cost that the insurance company undertake in paying out death benefits. Administrative expenses. Administrative expenses of the insurance companies are its cost of doing business. The expenses include selling costs, which involves marketing, agent commissions, you know, I say that before. Secondly, on the writing and aging policy. So now the insurance company uh, incurs some expenses through the underwriting. For example, if somebody, mm -hmm. if they need some medical done for somebody during underwriting process, they have to send a nurse to the person's house, you know, to draw the blood, to run all those tests and stuff like that. All those costs, all right, are costs that the insurance company bear during underwriting process. Now, costs associated with investigating and paying claims. Mm -hmm. That's self-explanatory. And then income taxes. These costs are deducted from the policyholder's investment account as a percentage of the annual deposit to the account or as a flat monthly fee. Because of its complexity, the cost for a universal life policy are higher than for them. For them, whole life or T100. Interesting. <laughs> Investment income. Uh, there are many investments from which the policyholder may choose 
details about investments are discussed more are discussed in more details in the investment choices section. Because the policyholder sees how the mortality cost and administrative charges are calculated, the policyholder gets a clear picture of how investments are performing. Investment growth is tax-free, providing it is less than the limit set out in the Income Tax Act. And this will be discussed more in the exemption tax section. Flexibility for the policyholder. Universal life insurance provides many options for the policyholder when the policy is issued and while it continues to be enforced. Changes can be made to best suit evolving policyholders' needs. The following factors are all flexible that is changeable in a universal life policy. Option number one is the timing and amount of the premium, very flexible. The face amount, recall that the face amount in the, is the amount of insurance taken out. Debt benefit is the amount of, and debt benefit is the amount received by the beneficiary when the life insured dies. And these two, so can be quite different. Hmm. Yeah, and the life. So the last one is the life or lives insured. Now, timing and amount of premium. Within a specified limit, the policyholder can decide how much and when to pay premium. Yeah, there is a minimum premium requirement. There is also a maximum premium limit and a premium flexibility in between these two extremes. All deposits go to the investment account. The minimum premium pays the life insurance mortality cost and the policyholder's administrative expenses and premium tax and is designed to keep the policy in force until age 100. When the minimum premium is paid, the account is said to be minimally funded. And as the minimum premium is not enough to build up the investment account within the policy, the minimum premium respects the deposit limits in order to keep the policy tax exempt. When the maximum premium is paid, the account is said to be maximum funded. Now, deposit flexibility is available between making the smallest deposit and making the largest. This flexibility permits lump sum deposit and higher regular deposit to be made as, it, as desired. This premium deposit will build the investment account value. And when the account is more than minimally funded, it has more value than needed to be associated account cost. Now, premium deposit can be reduced or stopped for a period of time, and withdrawal can be made as long as the investment account can support the insurance company's mortality and expense deductions. For example, Elaine has a universal life on her own life. The policy specifies minimum premium of 325 per month. But, the, but she currently deposits premium of 500 per month. And the policy has a cash value of 2,900. You see, so what this is saying in essence is that with universal life, we have the minimum deposit and the maximum deposit. So you can pay the minimum deposit, like I tell people, if the, the financial situation is not as buoyant as of yet, the individual can be paying the minimum deposit for now until their financial situation improves. However, if one chooses to pay those minimum deposit, it's not going to create a fund in the investment account. This is what does. Basically, basically what this is telling us. 
And then on the other end, for someone that is putting more money, putting the maximum, that is creating enough fund in the investment account. Again, there is a limit, okay, to how much from one can put into the universal life in order not to trigger taxes. That's why we have the tax exempt clauses, which we'll be discussing in the later um, as we go on in the course of this lesson, or maybe the subsequent ones. Okay. Now, insufficient account value. If the account value cannot pay the mortality costs and policy expenses, then the policy could lapse. You see, when you hear uh, mortality costs, okay, we'll explain what mortality costs. You see, it's the cost of insurance company paying the death benefit. Mortality cost is simply what tells insurance company that, okay, in, remember, people are grouped in different groups based on their age, gender, health condition, and stuff like that. And in those groups, insurance company have the statistics, okay? In this group, this is the probability of people dying, right? And then they, based on that, they're able to make projections of the cost of death benefit they are going to be paying out in that particular year. So that will be their own mortality cost. And based on those data and those statistics, insurance company requires certain minimum amount to cover those mortality costs, right? And that is what that is all about. And then when there's insufficient fund, because sufficient fund is enough fund to cover mortality costs and then expenses. However, if there's no sufficient fund to cover the mortality costs and expenses, because the mortality costs and expenses is what constitute, and taxes is what constitute the minimum deposit to keep the policy going. If there's, that is not present, then the policy will lapse, all right? Insufficient account value can you know, be resulted of minimum funding, withdrawal from the policy, few or no deposit to the account, low or negative investment return, for example. Elaine is pregnant and she plans to, you see, Elaine just continue from, you know, uh -huh. and she plans to take one year maternity leave from the job, which will result in decreased income for that period. To ease the pressure on her cash flow, Elaine can reduce her premium or even stop paying premium for a period of time. If she stops the premium entirely, the policy will likely lapse after about eight or nine months. That is 2,900 divided by 325, which is her minimum deposit. And because the account value will be exhausted by the mortality and expense deductions, okay? Model factor for UN policies. Remember model factor? <clears throat> if you don't remember, then I would like to say we should go back. Anyways, we will we'll learn it more here. For term insurance and whole life insurance policies and whole life insurance policies, the model factor almost always reflects an interest charge that the policyholder must pay to the insurance company in exchange for spreading the premium out over a series of payments. All right, for most US policies, the model factor is one divided by number of payments per year. Therefore, the insurance company does not apply the model factor to this type of policy, for example, in section 3234, example chose a term policy with this was in chapter two, which the model factor of 0.088, such that an annual premium of 956 became a monthly premium of 8430, calculated by 956 times this over the course of one year. The total premium will be this calculated by 84.13 times 12, which is 6% higher than the quoted premium of 956. But the majority of the universal life policies, model factor for monthly payment is 0 
33 calculated as one divided by 12. All right, now, model factor for semi-annual policy is 0 0.50 calculated as one divided by two. In this case, the annual and annualized premiums are the same. All right, we move on to face amount. Let me move my own. To there we go. Face and mad. Oh, this is interesting one. Don't worry. And I hope you're following. I hope you're paying attention. And I hope you're learning. You see, um, my goal is to make sure that this you don't look at this as being so complicated. Really, they are not. All right. The face amount is specified when policy is taken out. The policyholder can add additional coverage to the policy in the future, subject to providing evidence of insurability. If the policy has a guaranteed insurability rider, which is discussed later in this chapter, evidence of insurability is not required. And the new premium for the additional coverage will be calculated based on attained age basis. What is this talking about? You see insurability, you see here at 10A, and you see, come on. You've seen this before, haven't you? <laughs> All right. Um, this is basically telling us that a policyholder can add additional coverage. For example, somebody has 500,000 uh, life coverage. And five years later, and they want to um, add additional 500,000. Well, they can do that if there is insurability clause in the current policy. It means that they can do that without providing any additional insurability, um, um, and what's it called? Insurability, evidence of insurability, all right? Mm -hmm. But their premium will be calculated based on their time age. What that means is that if they were 30 years, 10 years ago, when they took out this policy, 10 years later now they are 40, so their new premium will be based on their, this additional coverage they've taken, the premium on this additional coverage will be based on their now attained age, which is 40 years old, okay? Now, so now increases and decreases to the face amount of the policy are usually restricted to minimum amount. That is an increase of 25,000 or decrease of at least 10,000 to minimize the administrative costs involved in making such changes. You know, sometimes people may want to like increase by maybe a little amount or stuff like that. So it depends. There's, there could be a minimum amount that one can increase and, um, sorry, in, there could be an amount to increase or decrease, minimum amount to decrease, minimum amount to increase and the minimum amount to decrease. And this is for insurance companies, the costs, the expenses associates with making all these changes, all right? Changes to the face amount impacts the cash value in the policy, as mortality costs are directly linked to the face amount. Increased face amount leads to increased mortality charges, unless the insurance company compensates by charging higher premiums. And this would lead to a smaller amount of premium deposits being available for investments after the mortality charges have been deducted from the investment account and this could result in the erosion of the policy's cash value. This is pretty much straightforward, okay? All right, a, decrease, a decreased face amount leads to a decreased mortality charge. More of the premium deposit is available for investment, which could result in a higher cash value. For example, Richard and Mariah ages 38 and 42 already have two children aged 15 and 17. Richard has a 500,000 US policy on his own life. 
Maria is employed and earn a good salary and they have no major debt. Richard bought you a policy a few years ago to ensure that if he dies, Maria will have enough money to raise the children right through their post-secondary education. Much to their surprise, Richard and Maria have just learned that Maria is pregnant with twins. Richard decided to increase his UL coverage by 500,000. He was able to do so within his existing UL policy. And after providing proof of insurability, if their cash flow is limited while Maria is on maternity leave and there is sufficient cash value within the policy, Richard may be able to have this increased coverage without increasing his premium for the time being, as we will discuss shortly. Okay, so that example explains it all and is pretty much straightforward. So there's no need to start uh, explaining it any further. Now we're going to be looking at life and life insured. Life for one and lives for multiple in short, okay? One universal life policy can be used to ensure multiple lives, either on a joint life basis, a single life basis, or depending on the insurance company sometimes both. For example, you bought a universal life that includes 500,000 of drinks, last to die coverage on the lives of himself and his wife, Jerry. And another 1 million in individual coverage on his own life. The joint coverage is payable to the estates of the last to die and is intended to be used to offset the tax liability that will be triggered upon the last of their debts on their certain estates assets. They want to live on their on the uncertain estate assets they want to leave for their, to their children. The individual coverage is payable to Sherry upon Joe's death and is intended to help replace the family's lost income if Joe dies first. Mm, this is good stuff. Now, the ability to substitute one life in short for another is unique to you. The substitute person must provide evidence of insurability, for example. Cheryl is no longer able to care for their young children because she was paralyzed in an accident. Joe's sister Deborah has moved in with them and she has become an integral and essential part of the family. Joe decided to add Deborah as a new single life insured under his existing UL policy. Deborah had to provide proof of insurability before Joe could add her to the policy. Awesome. Pricing. <clears throat> Pricing the insurance component. The mortality cost. deducted from the investment account of a universal life policy are reflections of the net amount at risk. And the mortality costs, costing method used, which takes into consideration the following. The net amount at risk, NAAR, whether the mortality cost is based on yearly renewable term or whether the mortality cost is based on level cost of insurance or whether the mortality deduction is guaranteed or adjustable. So these are the different ways that the, um, the pricing of the, uh, um, the premium is calculated. We have YRT, level cost of insurance or guaranteed or adjustable. All right, net amount at risk. Now, the insurance company's risk in any policy is the amount that must be paid as a debt benefit. That is the risk 
that is what the insurance company is concerned about. That's their own risk, okay? The policy reserves that insurance company builds up over time decreases the amount at risk. That, and that, this tells us that when the policy is new, the amount at risk is very high. But as the person continues to pay, the insurance company is building up reserves to a point where the amount at risk will be reduced drastically. And that risk is called the net amount at risk in universal life policy. Now, this net amount at risk is debt benefit minus investment value. The calculation and the way to calculate the net amount at risk is debt benefit minus investment account. You want to write that down? Because if they give you, um, let me get some, let me actually get some shit from the program. All right. So the amount of trees, which is NAAR, is equal to the debt benefit, okay, minus investment account value. All right. Now note that the debt benefit in this formula refers to the full amount payable upon death. Okay, so this debt benefit they are talking about is the full benefit. Because so even me myself, I was just thinking, okay, how about increasing debt benefit? You see, increasing debt benefit, yeah, so that is the full amount combination, of, okay? Now, therefore, the higher the value of the investment amount, the lower of the net amount at risk. The lower the net amount at risk, the lower mortality charges they account to the account, okay? And the lower the mortality charges, the more the investment account can grow. Oh my God, this is so like, like a web, like a cold web. <laughs> For example, Patrick owns a universal life with a debt benefit of 500,000, an account value of 128,000. Now, the current net amount at risk of his policy will be 372, which is calculated at 500,000 minus 128. All right? Now, yearly renewable term, cost of insurance is expressed as a dollar amount per 1,000 of risk. For a universal life policy, pay 1,000 of NAAR. Now, mortality cost is equal to net amount at risk multiplied by cost of insurance divided by 1,000. Hmm. So we've seen NAAR, how to get it. And now, mortality cost. is equal to NAAR, which is net amount at risk, multiplied by cost of insurance, divided by 1,000. Example, suppose that for the current policy, a purchase policy has cost of insurance of 18.57, and the insurance company will make a mortality deductions of 6,908 from his account. So this will be calculated that this 9A are times 37 to divide by 1,000, okay? A policyholder can choose between two ways of applying the risk of debt to the net amount at risk. Yearly renewable costing, level of cost of insurance as discussed below in section 433. Now for term insurance, mortality cost for a period of time, the risk that the life insurance will die during that period is equal to probability of death multiplied by death benefits, okay? Now, YRT is a one-year term insurance that renew at the end of every year, all right? So it means that the, the cost of insurance is calculated every year. And the reason is because as you get older, 
your cost of insurance is increasing. It's costing the insurance company more money to insure you as you get older, okay? The cost of universal life insurance based on YRP per 1,000 at risk increases each year because the risk of death increases with age, with the exception of the first few years of life. All right? Now, that is YRT for you. Level cost of insurance. Mortality costing based on a level cost of insurance is based on the premium for 8100 policy, for which premiums are guaranteed to remain level for life. The amount at risk remain constant and the risk of death is spread evenly over the duration of the policy. For a universal life based, for a universal life policy, for a U.S. policy based in level cost of insurance, the cost per 1,000 of risk remain constant over the duration of the policy. Choosing between YRT and level cost of insurance. Cost, level cost of insurance under YRT is lower in early years than the cost of insurance for level cost of insurance costing. <laughs> that is a lot of cost of this is great. <laughs> the lower cost under YRT means lower deductions from the investment account. Less is paid for the mortality charges and more money remains in the investment account to allow investment to grow. Therefore, a younger policyholder is well is well served during the early years of his policy by YRT costing because his mortality cost is low. In later years, mortality charges can be quite high and may erode the policy's cash value unless there are higher investment returns to offset the higher cost. YRT is a good choice if the policyholder who qualify for low term rates mm -hmm. and he wants more of his deposit to be invested in the early years of the policy. Mm -hmm. With level cost of insurance costing, mortality cost deductions are higher in the early years. And this means that there are higher deductions from the investment account and less premium invested, which can result in lower investment account value, of course. In later years, mortality cost deductions are lower with level cost of insurance than with YRT, which will help preserve the policy cash value. Wow, this is interesting. Now, I think I'm going to go check out all these level cost of insurance and compare to a switch from YRT to level cost of insurance may be possible. The reverse going from level cost of insurance to YRT is usually not permitted. Yeah. Table 4.1 compares mortality deductions for YRT and mortality deductions for level cost of insurance. For a US policy purchase for a 40 year old woman, who smokes and is in good health with a debt benefit of 500,000 plus account value. Let's see. See, cost of insurance per 1,000 using yearly renewable term. Yearly renewable term, oh my God, okay. So YRT is 1,000. Why are the costs per file? Okay. Okay, so the first year is this. Okay, level cost of insurance. Okay, you can see that for this is why the, the first year is so cheap, right? Making the person to pay less, right? What am I saying? Why are the costs per 500 is this? Now, See year six. This is level cost of insurance. By year 26, there are two. 
both royalty and level cost of insurance is the same. By year 21, now royalty is higher than level cost of insurance. Okay. Interesting. You see that? You guys, you see? So if you use YRT for client, yes, in the early years, the cost of insurance is lower, all right? And then for level cost of insurance, the cost of insurance is higher. However, look at by year six, YRT is still lower, but by year, which year was that again? By year 26, they are almost at par. By year 36, royalty is now becoming freaking more higher than level cost of insurance. And by the 36, level cost of insurance is now very low, which will now result in ability to preserve the cash value in this policy. Okay. Guarantee versus adjustable mortality deduction. Okay. You remember uh, we were looking at the three um, uh, cost of uh, determining premiums that one pays, right? Level cost of insurance, YRT, and the third one is adjustable mortality deductions. Okay. Um, All right, we are making good progress. I'm checking. And then now, uh, UA policyholders typically refers to assurance of knowing exactly how facial mortality deductions are going to be calculated. Insurance companies typically prefer being able to adjust the cost of insurance schedules to reflect their actual experience with mortality investment returns in administrative expenses. Agents should understand policies to determine whether the cost, the cost schedules are guaranteed for life or subject to adjustment. Agents should advise clients based on this information. Open-ended or restricted increases. An adjustment in cost may open-ended no limit to the amount of increase or restricted. Most adjustable policies places a restrictions on increases, such as limiting increases to 25%, 50%, or 100% of the original schedule or a specific dollar amount. Debt benefit options. The debt benefit is another flexible option in the universal life policy. There are a variety of debt benefit options available. The most common options are level debt benefit, okay, debt benefit options, okay, okay. All right, guys. Now, I don't want us to continue into another terrain without telling you guys that, hey, we've closed a curtain on cost of insurance. All right, and we've talked about the difference. You see, I actually had this conversation a couple of days ago with one of our, one, one of my team members. We were looking at the cost of insurance, different types of cost of insurance, which is YRT, level cost of insurance, and adjustable, and uh, what do they even call it again? Adjustable, yes, this one guaranteed versus adjustable mortality deductions. Okay, those are the three ways we can specify um, cost of insurance. So now we've talked about, we've looked into YRT, we've seen that YRT at the beginning, the cost of insurance because the person is younger, is lower, enabling more money to be put towards the investment. However, low um, level cost of insurance, level the cost of insurance across the board. So making, higher cost of insurance in today's present age. However, as the person grow older, because his level cost of it, it gets more cheaper for the person than YRT, all right? And then which enables more, uh, the cash value 
to be preserved in the later years. So now, even me myself, I'm now so curious. I'm going to run illustration on these three types and dissect it. Oh my goodness. If you want, you know, to get together with me on one on one, so we can look at this in real practical sense, just leave a comment in the comment section and make sure you subscribe. And then I will reach out for us to schedule a time to do that. The real practical stuff. All right. If you're in my uh, team, you don't need to worry. We'll be working on that by now, or if, if not, we'll get to it a little time. Now, we are moving on to death benefit options. Okay? Death benefit options. The different ways that the death benefits are paid. Okay? Now, we have level death benefit, increasing death benefit. Do we even have any other one? which is, all right? So now there are a variety of death benefit options available. The most common one are level debt benefit, level debt benefit plus amount value, level debt benefit plus accumulated, accumulative premium, and also index benefit. Index benefits, uh, do we have that one in Canada? That should be IUL, right? Anyways, we'll see. So they are giving us four here. I'm most familiar with level and increasing, which is debt benefit plus account value. Now we have debt benefit plus cumulative premium. Cumulative premiums. And then the fourth one is debt benefit, debt indexed debt benefit. All right? Don't forget, because in case they'll ask you, what are the debt benefit options that are available to a universal life? There's debt benefit, level debt benefit, level debt benefit plus account value, level debt benefit plus accumulative premiums, and index debt benefit. I'm sure they're going to explain this, all these four things. There is also each one affects the net amount of at risk and the mortality charges deducted from the investment account. Regardless of options selected, the beneficiary receives the debt benefit. Regardless, regardless, <laughs> regardless of the option selected, you see, the beneficiary receives the debt benefit tax-free. All right? Okay. So, now we are moving on to talk about level debt benefit. Uh, do, do, do. Level debt benefit. The level debt benefit is offered in one of two forms. A debt benefit equal to the face amount, regardless of whether life, regardless of when the life insured dies. For example, Face amount is equal to 250,000. Debt benefit is equal to 250,000. That is level. Okay? Yes, that is level for you. Regardless, whether you have a cash value that is 1 million, your debt benefit will be your face amount. Okay? And if you have 250 um, face amount and you have a fund value of 100,000 and you take that 100,000, your debt benefit will remain. 150. I believe they are going to explain to us as we go. All right. The benefit equals the policy's amount. So the policy's account value. When the account is worth more than the face amount. For example, face amount equal to 250. Investment account is 275. Debt benefit is 275. Since the net amount of risk equal debt benefit, benefit minus the account value under this option, as the account value grows, the net amount of risk decreases. And so to the mortality deductions from the investment account. Now, because of the increasing net amount of risk over time, the level debt benefit option is the least expensive of the debt benefit option to the policyholder. 
It is most suitable for individuals who do not have and will not anticipate an increase in insurance needs. So let's go back again. What are the things? For example, fixed amount. The debt benefit equal the policy account value when the account is worth more than the face amount. And they're talking about level debt benefit here. See, I'm going back up. Oh, I'm saying, for example, face amount is 250, investment account is 275. Debt benefit is 275. Okay, let's keep going. Because what I know with level debt benefit, whatever is in the investment doesn't get added to, to the debt benefit, right? Okay. All right, since the net amount at risk equal the debt benefit minus the account value under this option, okay? As the account value grows, the net amount at risk decreases. Okay, we've read this one. Because of the increasing net amount of risk over time, the level debt benefit option is least expensive of the debt benefit option to the policyholder. It is most suitable for individuals who do not have and will not anticipate level debt benefit plus cash value. Under the level debt benefit plus account value option, the debt benefit the debt benefit is the original face amount of the policy plus the value of the investment account. With this option, the net amount at risk is the level, is the, is the level over the duration of the policy Why the debt benefit increases. Because the net amount at risk remains level, mortality deductions will be greater and the investment account will grow at slower pace than your policy with the level debt benefit. This option is more suitable for individuals who can deposit large premiums in excess of the minimum premium required. Level debt benefit plus cumulative premiums. Yeah, I'm curious to know this one. Uh -huh. All right, so level debt benefit plus cumulative premiums. Under the level debt benefit plus cumulative premiums options, upon debt of the life insured, the beneficiary received the original face amount plus the sum of all premiums paid. The premiums are actually refunded when the life insured died with this option. And this is typically the most expensive death benefit options. Okay. And with this option, the calculation is net amount at risk, which is original face amount, plus the cumulative premiums, minus the account value. Mm. Now, this option reduces the net amount at risk quickly. The mortality cost deductions are reduced are reduced, which allows for the investment account to grow as at a faster pace. The extent that the investment account exceeds the original face amount plus cumulative funds, the insurance company keeps the excess amount. This option is, ensures the premiums are not forfeited by the policy holder if the life insurance dies early in the life of the policy. It is more suitable for individuals who plan on maximizing their premiums, okay? Index debt benefit. The index debt benefit <laughs> is the face amount index for inflation, okay? The face amount increases each year by inflation rate. Canada's inflation rate as shown in CPI is currently about 2%. This has a compound effect since every year's increase is applied to 
and already increase their benefits. Over time, such growth can become significant. Policies index the inflation rate to either um, achieve the following objectives, the consumer price index, CPI, or the policyholders' um, choice of, <laughs> of indexation rate between 1% and 8% when acquiring the policy. However, if the account value is greater than the index that benefits, the insurance company keeps the insurance between the two. Under this option, the net amount at risk and mortality deduction increases over time, depending on the index rate chosen by the policyholder. This is say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this net benefit option is most suitable for individuals desiring to protect an end of life risk that is expected to increase over time, that is tax liability on assets that will appreciate in fact. All right? Excuse me. Investment component. Investment component. All right. Investment components in the universal life. Let's see. Yes, we we're making progress. We are moving in chapter four. All right. You learning something? All right. Investment components. The following features are what makes a UL policy unique from other forms of life insurance. Net premium tax deferral. Investment component choices and impact of return on policy viability. Each will be discussed in details below, all right? Now, net premium, all right? Now, a gross premium is the total amount of deposit or premium paid by the policyholder. So that is the net premium, right? If that is, sorry, that is a gross premium. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, So we move on to the net premium. A net premium is the money that remains after the premium tax, right? It is just like a gross income, net income, typical kind of thing, right? That's why it is here. A gross premium is the total amount of deposit or premium paid by the policyholder, all right? Now we move on to the net premium. Is the money that remains after the premium tax, the mortality charge and policy expenses are deducted from the gross premium. Therefore, the gross premium minus premium tax minus mortality charge minus expense deductions is equal to net premium. You got it? If you don't get it, Flor, don't forget about it. Go over it again and you will get it. All right. Now, the net premium is invested with the policyholder's investment account. As mortality deductions decreases, the amount available for investment increases, assuming the policy paid remain constant. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main benefits of a UL policy is that it gives a policyholder a way to invest in a tax sheltered environment. A policy is tested annually to ensure it will be tax exempt. See chapter seven for more details on the tax exempt and we will get eventually. If it fails the test, that if more money gets into the plan and that lead that was covering you know, the taxes <laughs> from coming in, or it appears that the policy will fail the test, then the net premium may be reduced by the insurance company so that the money going um, uh, into the policy's investment will not trigger taxes. In other words, the insurance company limits the amount of the premium going into the policies in policy in premium to maintain the policy's tax-free status. 
If the maximum net premium is exceeded, the excess is deposited to a side fund of the policy. Investment returns in the side account will be taxable. Hmm. Tax deferral. What does it mean? Income earned in a universal life policy investment account is tax exempt as long as the income earned remains within the policy's investment account. Investment returns may be reinvested, which leads to compound growth and an increase in an account value. If the debt benefit includes the account value, then the investment growth may never be subject to taxation. That's right. Investment choices. What investment choices do we have? The policyholder is responsible for management of his investment account. And that's where we come in as advisors, right? We work with the policyholder to make some good choices when it comes to choosing this investment account. This differs from other permanent, this differs from other permanent insurance policies where the insurance company is responsible for the investment of the policies fund. And that's why there is no as much transparency, right? For example, whole life, the insurance company manages the investment account and the policy holder doesn't have visibility to those investment accounts. Net premiums may be directed towards one or many different types of investment they include but are not restricted to the following daily interest accounts. One, yeah, investment can be into daily interest account. Now, what is daily interest account? Daily interest accounts are accounts that offers a usually low interest rate based on the yield of a specified benchmark. The minimum return is 0% and the principal is guaranteed. As such, returns may only be flat or positive, but never negative. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Guaranteed investment account, that is GIA. Guaranteed investment account, GIA provides fixed interest rate for a return term beginning at one year and last up to 20 years. Often <clears throat> a guaranteed minimum interest rate based on a specified benchmark. Now the minimum return is zero, so the principal is guaranteed. A market value adjustment or penalty may apply if the policyholder redeems the GIA prior to its maturity. Returns may be flat or positive, but never negative. As a GIA matures, the proceeds are rolled over into a policy's active investment account, unless the policy would have request that they roll over to a new GIA of the same term. Index funds investment. An index fund investment ends interest based on the returns from a chosen index. Indexes are available based on equities, bonds, or combination of both. Size of market capitalization or objective growth or income. Management fees may be charged against the value of the investment returns. And the management fee may be flat, positive, or negative, sorry. Maybe may against the value of the investment, full stop. Returns may be flat, positive, or negative. Then another investment option is mutual funds. Remember, we're looking at investment options. We've looked at CIA, we've looked at index funds investment, and now we are looking at mutual fund investment. A mutual fund investment ends interest based on mutual fund returns. Mutual funds are available based on equities, bonds, or a combination of both. Size of market capitalization, management style, or focused on a specified geographic region. 
Management fees may be charged against the value of the investment. Again, uh, mutual fund investment returns may be flat, positive, or negative. Okay? Impacts of investment returns on positive viability. So what is the impact? I think we've looked at that. It, this came up somewhere, but in passing, but now we're going to see the detailed impact of investment return on policy viability. Deposits, mortality charges, expenses, and investment returns affect value of the investment account and must all be monitored by the policyholder to ensure funds are always available in the investment account to cover costs. You see, that's why I love to do annual, re uh, annual review with my clients. We get to see those returns. We get to see how they are doing. And I love it. Every time I do that, we get to see, you know, if there's anything we've missed, if there's anything we updated, if there's anything that we need to add. All right. If mortality costs increases, then the investment account will go slowly or be declining value. If investment returns are lower than expected or negative, then the mortality deductions may erode the value of the investment account at a more rapid pace. A shortfall for costs will require extra deposit to be made or the policy could lapse. All right, now policy illustrations. Your policy documentation includes a policy illustration, a chart or table that projects value of the deposits, mortality charges, investment accounts value, cash surrender value, and debt benefit for each future year. There are usually two sets of illustrations provided to the potential policy holder. One is based on the current or requested rate of returns and the other is at a lower rate of return on investment. Insurance agents must advise clients that the illustration is intended to demonstrate how the policy works. It says that the, the projected returns are not guaranteed and that actual performance may deviate from expected performance. The potential policyholder must sign the illustrations provided to him by his agent as evidence that he has seen the document and understand the illustration of the insurance, sorry, of the illustration, accumulating funds. The investment funds or accumulating funds of a U.S. policy provides the policyholder with the following non forfeiture benefits. Surrendering the policy, Policy withdrawal, which is partial surrender, premium offset, policy loan, collateral for third party loans, leveraging and distribution upon death. All these are um, investment funds accumulated from the policy that with the following non forfeiture benefits. All these are non forfeiture benefits that are available to the policy holder. Now, surrendering the policy. Okay, what does that mean to surrender a policy? <laughs> okay. Surrendering the policy. A policy may be surrendered and the policy holder will receive the cash value of the investment account minus any applicable surrender charges. Surrender charges apply up to 10 years after policy is issued. But that's why I love one of our partners, CPP, their own surrender years is just six years. Surrender charges is a multiple, is a multiple of percentage of the annual mortality cost that will be charged under level cost of insurance costing. It is deducted from the cash surrender value and can reduce cash surrender value to zero but not less than zero. For example, if mortality cost is $1,000 and the surrender multiply, multiple is two, then the surrender charge is 2,000. And if the policy surrender value is one five, 
it is reduced to zero, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the charge decline over time and may eventually be eliminated. Tax may be applied to the amount received by the policy holder as withdrawn or surrendering the policy may result in a taxable policy gain. Okay? UL is the only type, okay, no, we are looking at policy withdrawal or partial surrender. UL is the only type of life insurance policy that permits withdrawal. The withdrawal is taken from the cash value of the investment account and is considered to be partial surrender. There is no need to repay withdrawal, okay? A withdrawal reduces cash value in the account and if not repaid, reduces the debt benefit. A minimum withdrawal amount may be imposed by the insurance company. And the maximum withdrawal is the cash surrender value. Surrender charges as well as taxes may apply to the withdrawal. And because mortality costs and expenses are deducted from the investment account, a withdrawal may be negatively affected. Uh, a withdrawal may negatively affect investment growth and the longevity of the longevity of the policy. For example, Andrew has a U.S. policy with a level debt benefit. You see, all the, remember this is a level debt benefit of two hundred thousand and a current cash value of 21,000. The policy is based on level cost of insurance mortality costing with a mortality deduction of 3,800 per year. Andrew lost his job and he is running short of form. So he is thinking about withdrawing 20,000 from his U.S. policy. While his contract allows the withdrawal, Andrew should know that it will reduce debt benefit to 180,000 and the cash value of the policy would decrease to only $1,000. This puts the policy in danger of lapsing because there won't be enough money in the account to cover the next mortality deductions of 3,800. Unless Andrew can deposit additional premium before the deduction comes due. Okay, so this is level debt benefit for you. So with level debt benefit, uh, the debt benefit and the face amount is the same. If the policy grows, and like in Andrew's case, now there's a cash value of 20,000 20, and he took 20,000. You can see the way that reduces his debt benefit to 180K. I think I have mentioned it somewhere earlier. Anyways, all right, premium offset. All right, participating whole life, participating whole life policy provides the policy holder with a choice of using policy dividends to offset their premiums. Premiums are naturally offset, offset by investment income and the policy holders deposit to the investment account because of the way the investment account of a US policy works. Depending on the premium deposited into the policy, and the investment returns came within the policy, the investment account can grow to such a size that it can be used to fund future mortality and expense deductions indefinitely. The policyholder can stop paying the premium while maintaining his policy in force. For example, the water bought a 500,000 universal life several decades ago based on level cost of insurance mortality deductions of 10,500 annually. World can always deposited the maximum premium permitted to the policy, and he has made some rewarding investment choices. As a result, the policy currently has a cash value of 460,000. Because Walker is currently 65 years old, he could stop paying premium, and the policy will likely remain in force for the duration of his lifetime, because if he wants to do this, 
he should adjust his investment mix within the policy to those investments that offset principal guaranteed. Mm -hmm. All right, policy loan. A loan is typically limited to 50 to 90% of the cash value of the investment account. Interest is charged on the loan and is set at the time the loan is taken. There is no requirement to repay the loan. Any unpaid loan balance and accumulated interest will be deducted from the debt benefit. Taxes may apply since a policy loan is considered to be a taxable disposition. Hmm, really? Now, a benefit of taking out a policy loan rather than withdrawing money from the policy is that funds continue to earn tax sheltered income within the policy's investment account. On the other hand, the interest rate charged on the policy loan may be higher than the return on the funds. Yeah, so that's something that needs to be considered because if you are going to take care um, a loan and the interest, let's say it's 5%, then it only makes sense if your investment return is doing more than 5%. If your investment return is not doing more than 5%, then in that case, it doesn't make sense in my opinion, right? Joshua had a universal life policy. This is an example that named his daughter, Rebecca, as the beneficiary. The policy had a 250,000 level debt benefit and a cash surrender value of 35,600. When he took a policy loan of 30,000 at an interest rate of 4% annually to help pay for her post-secondary education by taking the policy loan, Joshua also had to report taxable income of 1,800. According to the information provided by his insurance company, one year later, Joshua died, assuming he did not take any principal or interest payment on the policy loan. Rebecca will receive debt benefit of 218, calculated as 250 minus 30,000. less 30,000 times 4%, all right? Now, the next one is collateral for third party loan. Now, the cash value of the investment account can be used as collateral for a loan from a third party such as financial institution. The financial institution is assured its loan will be repaid by the policy. Taking a loan, from the financial institution instead of directly from the policy, avoids any possibility of that. Okay. So in other words, policy loan and collateral loan, collateral loan is the best because with collateral loan, you are not going to pay taxes. Yeah. Depending on how the loan is structured, principal and interest payment may not be required. And the loan and accumulated interest will be paid upon death of the life insured by the death benefit with the residual death benefit going to the beneficiary. Example, suppose that instead of taking out a policy loan of 30,000, Joshua had taken a five-year loan from his local bank at 4% interest using his U.S. policy as collateral. At the end of the first year of the loan, Joshua made a repayment of 6,738 to the bank, which is 5,538 principal, 1,200 of interest, okay? When Joshua died one year after taking out the loan, the bank receives a debt benefit of 24,000, calculated as the 30,000 he took, minus the 5,538 that he repaid, and Rebecca, the daughter, will receive 225,538, which is calculated as the 250 debt benefit minus 
outstanding balance for the bank, which is 24,000. Since the investment account value is not reduced by the amount of the loan, it can continue to grow on a tax shelter basis. Policy loan is the way to go, guys. Mm -hmm. Leveraging. Leveraging is a variation of a third party loan where a loan can be obtained using cash surrender value and the debt benefit as collateral. Now, the proceeds of the loan are invested according to the policy owner's financial objective. Principles and interest payments are not required, and the loan plus accumulated accrued interest will be repaid upon the debt of the life insured by the debt benefit with the residual debt benefit going to the beneficiary. If the loan in, invest, in invested to produce, if the loan in invested, if the loan in invested, in invested, <laughs> this is the language, I don't understand, to produce property income, then the interest that accrued against the loan is tax sheltered by the policyholder. Using the cash surrender value as collateral avoids any tax liability that might occur if the policyholder took a policy loan or made a withdrawal from the policy. Right. Vital to the success of this strategy is that investment returns must be greater than the cost of borrowing. Exactly my point earlier. If the loan plus accrued interest exceed the cash surrender value, then the lender may <laughs> demand repayment of the loan. Leveraging can be a dangerous strategy if investment returns are lower than anticipated. Mm -hmm. The policyholder may have to surrender the insurance policy if the personal funds are not available to take to make the repayment. Mm -hmm. The first surrender of the policy may result in a potential tax liability. For example, Wendy has a U.S. policy with a 500,000 debt benefit and a cash surrender value of 260,000. She retired at age 55, earlier than anticipated, and think she may need to withdraw on her U.S. policy to support her retirement income until her CPP and AOS benefits start. However, if she simply withdraw the money from the policy, it will result in taxable income. Instead, she approached a bank about receiving a loan of 10,000 each year for the 10 years using a U.S. policy as collateral, and she will receive the loan, loan proceed tax-free, resulting in greater after-tax income than if she has withdrawn 10,000 from the policy each year. So when they will need to monitor the investment returns and within the policy to ensure that the loan and the ongoing mortality and expense deductions do not reduce the policy's cash surrender value to the point where it's less than outstanding loan plus accrued interest, all right? Distribution of um, debt. Um, okay, we are getting very close to the end of the chapter. Okay, so stick around with me. Okay, distribution upon debt. The amount paid as the debt benefit for each of the benefits paid options are as follows. Under the level debt benefits, we'll see that then the insurance company usually only pays out face amount through some policies will pay out the value of the investment account that exceeds the policy's face amount. Now under the level debt benefits account value options, then now the policy will pay out the original face amount plus the full value of investment account. Under the debt benefit level benefit accumulative fund options, sorry, accumulative premium option, the policy will pay out the original fees amount 
plus the sum of all the premiums, regardless of the value of the investment account. Any excess that may remain in the investment account is retained by the insurance company. Now, under the index debt benefit options, the policy will pay out the original face amount index accounting to the rate specified in the policy, regardless of the investment account. Any excess is retained by the insurance company. All right. Advantages and disadvantages of universal life insurance. Universal life insurance offers advantages that it offers considerably flexibility to the policyholder. Excuse me. <coughs> However, the disadvantage is that product is complex and may be difficult for the policyholder to understand. And that is why it's always important to work with your um, advisor on this. Uh, policyholder can increase or decrease or even suspend premium as long as the policy account value can support the mortality and expense deductions. Um, the advantage is a policyholder needs to actively monitor the performance of the investment account and make adjustments to the policy investment as needed. Um, another advantage of universal life is a policyholder has a choice of investments product. Yes, the policyholder makes a choice. However, the disadvantage is that um, <laughs> entire premium is subject to premium tax. Yes, the entire premium is subject to premium tax. Okay. <clears throat> Another advantage is that it offers the opportunity for tax sheltered investment within the limit. Now, policy performance is sensitive to changes in investment performance. Yeah. Now, comparing universal life and whole life. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you guys would like to see what is the difference between universal life and whole life. I'm curious to see that too. Now, mortality deductions and expenses. For mortality deductions and expenses, for universal life, mortality deductions and expenses are deducted from the investment account. Now for whole life, mortality deductions and expenses are taken from the policy reserves. Hmm. Now, for universal life, mortality deductions may be based on YLT or level cost of insurance costing. But there's none for whole life because the insurance company manages everything. Now, when it comes to premiums, for whole life, premiums are typically level for the life of the policy, unless it is an adjustable policy. Now for universal life, a missed premium does not trigger a premium loan mortality. A premium loan, mortality deductions and expense continues to be drawn from the investment account. Policy may last once the account value becomes insufficient to cover these deductions subject to a grace period. Now for whole life, a missed premium will trigger an automatic premium loan uh, addition automatic premium loan will be made until the cash surrender value becomes zero. And when the policy lapses, subject to grace period. Wow. All right. When it comes to dividend, mm. universal life does not provide policy dividend. However, whole life policy may pay dividend. The reason why we say may is because even though it's a participating policy, they can only pay if there is excess, excess, excess amount. You get it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> benefit. For that benefit, the difference between UL and whole life is that policyholder has options with respect to debt benefit. For example, debt benefit plus account value, debt benefit plus cumulative premiums, and stuff like that. But for whole life, debt benefit is generally not affected by the value of the investment account. 
Wow. Modal factor. What is the difference between UL and um, whole life when it comes to modal factor? Uh, modal factor is, the, is, is for UL is generally uh, not used, okay? Now for uh, whole life, modal factor applies if premiums are paid other than annually, okay? Now investment. Policyholders can choose how the investment account is invested. Before whole life, insurance company chooses how the policy reserves are being invested. You got it? All right. Okay. Now, using universal life insurance, the real purpose again. UL is most suitable for investment savvy policyholders with long term insurance needs who are also looking for tax advantage investment opportunities. It is best to use UL policy as an investment vehicle after the repayment of non deductible debt. Now, must have registered retirement savings plan, RRSP, and tax savings account. Individuals who have no available contribution room in the RRSP and TFSC can turn to a U.S. policy to continue to build their tax deferred savings, particularly if they have a higher marginal tax rate. From a tax efficient standpoint, Repayment of non-deductible debts before using UL insurance policy for the investment purpose is also recommended. For example, a lister is 45 years old and a senior project manager at an engineering company. His company offers a defined benefit pension plan, which severely limits his personal RRSP contribution issue. He has already maxed out his TFSC and he is looking for additional tax advantage way to save for retirement. He also wants 500,000 of life insurance coverage to create a scholarship fund upon his death. Alistair may be interested in a universal life insurance policy if he maximizes his premium to the policy. Now, the investment account. We group tax free if it chooses you a policy that pays out the um, debt benefit plus account value upon death. The entire amount will be paid out tax free, leaving an even large legacy. That's right. Tax free retirement income. Leveraging a US policy could provide a tax free retirement income. The U.S. policy provides collateral for a series of loans. The loan replaces income in retirement. Now, in practice, true leveraging is not considered to be appropriate if the person taking a loan for investment purpose has a short-term horizon. That is a short amount of time until the investment principle is needed. Most retirees are considered to have short-term horizon. For example, John expects to be in highest marginal tax rate during her retirement. So she is looking for sources of retirement income that would not be subject to tax. She has already marked out her tax savings account and does not want to put more money into registered retirement savings plan, RRSP. And because the withdrawal will be highly taxed due to her marginal tax rate, she can maximize fund, she can maximum fund a UL policy, which will provide tax-free investment growth during retirement. She can obtain a series of loans using the policy's cash value as a collateral because she won't actually be withdrawing the fund. No income tax is triggered. Furthermore, the investment account remains intact so it can continue to earn tax-free income. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of chapter four. All right, so I'm looking at my time. 
Now, I want us to go quickly to Q&A for chapter four. All right, um, chapter four, universal life. Okay, reattend. Okay. Whoa, 35 questions. Oops. So hopefully I can quickly get uh, through this. Uh, okay, no, not this, not this screen, I think. Um, mm, all right. Oh, my eyes, okay. Question number one, I wish I can figure out how to expand this because it's getting really, oh goodness Lord, what's this? It's getting really small for my eyes. Okay, now did I over increase it? No, I think I like the font right now, just that I can't see this side, but that's okay. Okay. After staring at the screen for a very long time, my eyes start to, you know, but I just want to have this class together in one place. All right. What do universal life policies not provide? Dividend, modal factor, premium, debt benefit, dividend. Okay, next. All right. For a U.S. policy, what is it called when the the 1,000 at risk necessarily remain constant over the duration of the policy. It's called level cost of risk, level cost of, uh, level constant risk, level cost of insurance, level cost of cost, level income cost, no, it's level cost of insurance, okay? Next, all right. How many universal life policies can be used to ensure multiple lives? either on a joint life basis, a single life basis, or depending on the insurance company, sometimes both. Is one. You don't need multiple insure universal life. So you can use one in universal life to insure single life, joint life, multiple life, okay? Okay, okay. Now, what accumulates within the policy tax free? as long as certain limits set by the Income Tax Act are not protected, all right? It's expense income, investment income, tax deduction, accumulated income. What accumulates within the policies tax-free as long as certain limits set by the Income Tax Act are not exceeded? Is it expense income? No. Investment income, I think so. Tax deductions, no. Accumulated income. It's between B and D. Investment income, accumulated income. You see, that's what you see most of the time with this. Investment income is income from the distance. But again, they are accumulated, right? Mm. I'm going to go with investment income, my God, and then we'll see at the end. Okay. What happens to the mortality deductions and expenses in whole life insurance? They are partially added to the policy. They are taken from the policy. They are added to the policy. They are partially taken from the policy. What happened to the mortality deductions and expenses in the whole life insurance? They are partially added to the policy. No, they are taken from the policy. They are added to the policy. They are partially taken from the policy. I believe they are taken from the policy, my guess, but again, I don't know everything, so we'll find out. Question number six. 
if the net benefit affected by the policy by the value of the investment account for the whole life if the debt benefit affected by the value of the investment account for whole life insurance is the debt benefit affected by the value of the investment account for whole life insurance always it depends never not generally is the debt benefit affected by the value of the investment account of the whole life insurance, the debt benefits, is it affected? You see, when we're looking at the, when we're comparing whole life and uh, this thing, right, we see that the debt benefits is not affected. I'm going to go with never, but again, we'll see. All right? All right, question seven. What is the name of the term insurance policy that renew at the end of every policy year? Annual renewable term, no. Periodic renewable term, no. Level cost of insurance, no. Yearly renewable term. It's yearly renewable term. Okay, now, because of the complexity and flexibility of universal life insurance, what tends to be higher than other form of premium permanent insurance? Administ investment income, administrative expenses, mortality costs, premium tax. It's premium tax. Okay. <clears throat> How are US policy premiums affected by investment income? and the policyholder's deposit to the investment account. How are you a policy premium affected by investment income and the policyholder's deposit to the investment account? They are increased, they are decreased, they are offset, there's no effect. How are you a premiums affected by investment income? How are you a premiums? How are your premiums affected by investment? I'm not sure about this. How are your policy premiums affected by investment income and the policy holders deposit to the investment account? Premiums, they are increased, they are decreased, they are offset. There's no effect. Uh, I think there will be no effect. Then I'm not sure. We'll see the answer and the rationale. Okay. Question 10. When leveraging a loan, how much of the amount can be? Can the policyholder invest elsewhere or to supplement his income? None of the amount. When leveraging a loan, how much of the amount can the policyholder invest elsewhere or to supplement his income? Half of the amount, the full amount, any amount. Hmm. None of the amount, half of the amount, the full amount, any amount. The question itself is as confusing as confused itself. Okay, the level debt benefit plus dash tends to be the most expensive option. Index premium, accumulate value, fixed premium, simulative premium. I think it's cumulative premium. Okay, what is it called? When the insurance company passes a percentage of the policyholder's premium onto provincial or territory government, investment income, premium tax, mortality charge, and it is a premium tax. Okay. What type of increase 
will require the insured person to provide evidence of insurability. Base amount, minimum amount, face amount, maximum amount is face amount. Okay. Ooh, let's do this real quick. Which debt benefit option does the policy pay out? The original face amount plus the full value of the investment account, level debt benefit, no, level debt plus account value, level debt plus cumulative premium index, no, is level plus account value. Okay. Question 15. When a permanent insurance policy builds up a policy reserve over time, what is decreased for the insurance company? What is decreased for the insurance company? Yes, amount at risk, yeah. The amount at risk is the answer. However, the option here is renewable, no, level cost of insurance, no surrender charge. You see, when they say what is decreased to insurance company is the amount at risk. But if they have said what is decreased to the policyholder, the answer would have been surrender charge. Okay, guys? Mm -hmm. Now, for universal life insurance, when, sorry, for universal life insurance, who, choose, who chooses how the investment account is invested? Oh, it's the policyholder, of course, not the life insured. Not the insured, yeah. Okay, this is a policy holder. 17, which investment offers fixed interest rate for one, two, three, blah, 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 even 20 years, 10? Select one, index fund investment, mutual fund investment, daily interest rate, guaranteed investment account. Which investment offers a fixed interest rate is guaranteed investment account, I believe. Because index is index in mutual fund, daily interest no is guaranteed, I will say, but we'll see. Uh, question number 18. Which option may be subject to management fees, which will reduce investment performance? Guaranteed investment account, mutual funds, treasury daily interest account. Hmm. Guaranteed investment account, mutual funds, investments, treasury bills, daily, I think it's mutual funds investment. Which web policy will impede the growth of the investment account and may add the long-term viability of the policy? Offset, withdrawal, or surrender. Loan. Which your policy will impede the growth of the investment account and may add the loan? Offset, withdrawal, loan, surrender. I think it's withdrawal. Which policy? Which your policy impede the growth in the investment account? I think it's withdrawal. Okay. and may add long-term viability. No, I may add the long-term viability of the policy, may impede the growth in investment account, and may add, uh, maybe loan, no. <laughs> let's, let's go with loan and see. <laughs> this is why it's sometimes good to read this again and again, right? Mm -hmm. If a client is looking for a greater short-term policy fund value, which option would they typically go with? M100, no. Yearly renewable, level cost of insurance, full life. If the client is looking for a short-term policy fund value, short-term, I would say level, no, yearly renewable term. Short-term. That's it. 20, which universal life policy charges is usually calculated 
as a multiple of percentage of the annual mortality deductions that will apply under level cost of insurance costing. Withdrawal, offset, surrenders, and loan. He surrenders. Okay. Next. <clears throat> What may the insurance company limit for policyholder to ensure that the policy remains tax exempt? Net premium, account value, index premium, cumulative premium. Index premium, account value, cumulative premium, Is net premium, I would say, but again, guys, for a US policy, that do, what does insurance company deduct from the policy's investment account? Mortality cost, premium tax, administrative expenses, investment taxes. For a U.S. policy, what does the insurance company deduct from the policy's investment account? Mortality cost, premium tax, administrative expenses, investment tax, maybe mortality cost, I'm not sure. Premium tax, all this. For a U.S. policy, what does the insurance company deduct from the policy's investment account? Hmm. Which benefit might be appropriate to cover end life risk? that is expected to increase over time. Cumulative, index, fixed, accumulative is index. Which type of person is described as appropriate for choosing universal life insurance? Experience with insurance, tech savvy, investment savvy, Business oriented. I would say investment savvy. Okay. Under, under what option does the level debt benefit equals to original face amount of insurance of the policy? Under what option does the level debt benefit equal the origi original face amount? of insurance of the policies, cumulative fixed index account value, fixed. Not exactly sure about that, but I just want us to quickly finish this. Um, what is not an advantage of universal life insurance? We are looking for the wrong answer here. Offers less flexibility. to the policy holder. That is, this is offer less, no? It offers flexibility. Offers little opportunity for tax shelter, no? What is not an advantage? Entire premium is subject to premium tax. Policyholder has limited choice of investment program. Okay, so it's like when we say what is an advantage of, and what is not an advantage of US insurance, what is not an advantage, offer less flexibility to the policyholder, offers little opportunity for tax shelter investment. It does offer 
this thing now. Entire premium is, yeah, this one is not an advantage. Entire premium is subject to premium tax. I'll go with this one. My eyes, oh my God, 28. With 2 policy, there are three pricing factors that are not necessarily fixed. They are called unbundled. Have whole life bonded, they are called unbonded. Yeah. All right. Which type of investment does not acquire a legal interest in the fund or in the securities that make up the index? Guaranteed investment account, index fund investment, mutual fund investment, dealing treasure does not acquire a legal interest in the fund. I have no idea of the securities. I'll just get daily interest account and then uh, we'll see. What do the modal factor almost always reflect that the policyholder must pay to the insurance company in exchange for spreading the premium over a series of payments? Maximum charge, no minimum charge, no interest charge, non interest charge is the interest charge. What do the modal factor almost always reflect? It reflects interest charge, okay? I thought I clicked next. Okay, that was a bit hungry there. Okay, which investment offers a minimum interest rate? based on the yield of the specified benchmark, guaranteed investment account, index fund investment, mutual fund daily interest, minimum based on yield of specified benchmark. I'll go with guarantee because it mentioned specified, but again, we are, Four questions away from finding the truth. <laughs> Which debt benefit option does the insurance company only pay out the face amount? Although some policies will pay out the value of the investment account that exceeds the policy's face amount. Index debt benefit, level debt plus accumulated fund option, level debt plus accumulated level debt level debt benefit option. You say which debt benefit option does the insurance company but only pay the fixed amount? Is did I say in this Jesus Christ? Level debt benefit. Gosh, please guys. <laughs> Let's try to read very well. Okay. What are the premiums typically for whole life insurance? High, decreasing, low, Level, they are level, right? I think so. 34, which debt benefit option will pay out the original face amount plus such of all premiums regardless of the value of the investment account? Level, no index, no level plus cumulative premium, yeah. All right. In tax deferral, which investment income is allowed to be fully reinvested within the policy? How? Whole gain and. So in tax deferral, which investment income is allowed to be fully reinvested within the policy? I think it's everything, right? Gain and. Or end income. Which income is allowed? End income. I am not sure. We'll find out. Have we finished? Oh, okay. All right. So I'll check to be sure that all your answers are saved. If we missed any, this is where you will know, okay, anyone with the answer. All right. So submit and submit, submit and finish. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. We meet one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
So we got, um, we missed eight out of 35. Okay. Okay. After you see, this finished 24 minutes. We did this in 24 minutes at this second. Great is 77%. Oh, unfortunately, you did not score at least 80%, which is what they recommended. So they recommend you score 80%. You know, and then so we urge you to try again. Now, so again, the recommendation is to aim to score eighty percent when you are doing all these practice questions. Now you have an edge now because you're with me and you are watching this. By the time you go to do this on your own, you have an advantage. Now I'm not going to go into some of the questions we have scored. If you want to read it, now you can pause it and read it. Okay. The one we get it right, you can pause it and read it so that I can explain the one we did not get, all right? Again, feel free to pause it and read the version now, okay? All right, oh, we didn't get this one. So it says, is the debt benefit affected by the value of the investment account of the owner? I will say never. They say no, it's generally not. Their benefit is generally not affected by the value of the investment account. So what is the difference between never and generally not? Not generally. Not these people, eh? Okay, we got this one. Oh, we didn't get this one. So this one is where they were asking about, uh, because of the complexity of the UL insurance. Huh. Tends to be higher uh -uh. administrative expenses. Because of the complexity of the flexibility of the UL, the administrative expenses tend to be higher than other forms of permanent insurance. Really? I thought this premium tax, oh, higher. Wow. Again, this one. Uh oh. Okay, please read this. Pause it and read the rationale, please. Okay. Again, oh, back to back. This when leveraging loan, how much of the amount? Okay. Well, the the answer is one. I oh, okay. Please pause it, read it. Okay. Now we got this on cumulative premiums. Okay, and we got this on premium tax. You see, I recommend you pause this, read it line by line, because when you read it, you especially the rationale, even though we get it, pause you to read the rationale, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have any question, leave it in the comment section. I'll come back and check and respond, okay? That's why I'm scrolling slowly to it. You know, you can pause it at any point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one we did not get it. It says which your policy will impede the growth of the investment? Uh oh, the correct I say withdrawal. Oh, interesting. Okay, please read the rationale, please. Then we got this one. Did you get this one? Yeah. We got this, we got this, and this. <laughs> oh, we didn't get this. Under what option does the level debt benefit equals the original face amount of insurance of the policy? We see fixed cumulative index account value. Oh. Oh you see that? So, again, let's try and read all this. We didn't get this one. Which type of investment does they acquire that does not acquire legal this interest? We said the interest, the answer is index form. Oh, all right. So, pause this, read the rationale, my darlings. So, yeah. 
Okay, now that you have it, we have come to the end of this class. And I'm super happy that I was able to uh, put together the chapter four and chapter four question and answer all together in one class for you. If you find value in this effort, please don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next class when we move forward onto chapter five. Until then, bye for now.